Hi guys, today we're working on uh, GPGPU inside JavaFX. GPGPU stands for General Purpose uh, GPU Computing, which is basically when you use GPU as your CPU. Uh, and there are various uh, advantages for doing that, because with CPUs you don't have that many cores compared to uh, GPUs. Uh, modern GPUs can go up to 2,000, 3,000 cores. And that's a massive advantage compared to the number of uh, CPU cores. For example, um, on this PC, I've got only six cores and uh, a GTX 1080, which has, I don't know how many cores it has, but it's got something. So we're going to try and test that out. And we will need a very simple application first. And then we'll see, um, We'll probably run it on CPU first in parallel and then see how that performs. And then we're going to run the same thing uh, on GPU. Okay, so we will need a scene, create content. Content is going to be Let's go for plane. I am on Java 11 for this one and JavaFX 15. And we're also going to be using the uh, APAR API library for GPGPU stuff. Root set for its size. Uh, let's define our size first. Final int. Um, actually, let's go bigger because that will benefit the demo, I think. So that's that. That's hopefully going to run. Yep, that's what we need, just a window. And then we're going to have... Um, number of particles actually no, no let's not do particles let's do something else um array length how about that and then we'll go from there so what i want to do is to have a very simple problem simplistic almost that is easily parallelizable because that's the whole point if you want to run something on gp gpu and utilize these many cores, you want something uh, that can be easily parallelized. So you need a naturally uh, parallel problem, uh, aka embarrassingly parallel problem. And these are um, a category of problems that have certain properties uh, about them. That the main property of which is that there is very little dependency between subtasks of the problem and because of that you're able to easily parallelize the subtasks so if i were to give a very simple example of a task that cannot be parallelized um, how about pressing a button so in order to press this uh, button for example i need to move my cursor over there and then click on the button so there are two main actions move and click these actions um, cannot be parallelized because you first have to move and then click. You can't click and then move. And you can't do both at the same time as well. So there is a sequence of events. There is a sequence of actions. And that sequence must be preserved in order for the algorithm to work correctly. Uh, whereas what we're about to do, if I do something like this, um, array one and then array two and then we're going to add numbers from one array to another actually we're going to use two arrays to get the numbers and then add the result into a third array that would be a naturally parallel problem and it's also um, something that many other problems can be sort of boiled down to for example the 
uh, particles demo that I did uh, a while ago using 10 million particles on GPU. That was essentially adding two numbers together from two different arrays. So you can see that certain problems can be boiled down to this problem that we're going to solve now. And array two. And the good news is because these are ints, I can use these ints to um, specify some color, for example, and then draw that color to the screen. This is why I've picked this specific length because this gives me that many pixels on the screen, which means I can easily check if the algorithm successfully computed all values correctly. And we can do that using animation timer or to give us some sort of um, loop, as it were, on update. And then on update, we're going to do something. Generate method. No, this one, yep. And in here, we need to, so there is an int stream, right? Which can be parallelized. Um, range closed. Uh, no, not close. So we start from zero and we go to array length. And then I should be able to obtain a parallel stream. Yep, that's perfect. That's an easy way to do parallel um, stuff in Java. And then for each, that gives us an index. So what we're essentially doing here is I'm going from zero to this value. And then for each index, I'm just going to store, I'm going to add two numbers, add that index into this result array. So result index is array one index plus array two index. So the algorithm actually is very simple. You have two arrays of the same length, or rather three arrays, and then you pick at that index in all the arrays, um, using the first two as those that drive the addition, and then the result is stored in a different third array. And then using that result, how about we add canvas? Because I know canvas can be used to draw pixels directly to it. Um, canvas, yeah, let's create a new one. New canvas uh, width height, and then just add it to the root. Get children add canvas. Yep, that'll do. Then we can get the canvas here. Get graphics context. Get pixel writer, and then set pixels. Well, one of these, I think it's this one. X and Y, uh, that's zero, zero. We start at zero, zero. We go up to width and height. We then provide the pixel format of int buffer. I think it's pixel format, get a RGB, that will do. And then what do we need? Then the buffer, which we do have, which is our result. Okay, this is going out of hand. Let's just move these things around. What was the full signature of this? And then the scan line stride, which is number between the pixel data for the start of one row, which is width. It is width, right? Because it's one row, that's how it finishes. So it's basically asking number of pixels in one row. And it still needs to take something. Offset. Offset is zero. Okay, that looks good. 
does it return an existing? Yeah. Because I didn't want that to be something that gets created every frame. Um, so it returns an existing value, which is fine. So that should populate the uh, int buffer of our canvas every frame when we do this. So if I set the result to be a very specific value so that both arrays always add up to the same number, then that number becomes the representation of the pixel that gets drawn to the screen, say red. In which case, I will know that if every single pixel is red, then the computation was successful. So we'll need to fill these values um, at some point. Let's do it here. Uh, I suppose we could use random, right? New random. And then for, well, I could just use array length. Array one. Well, first of all, I need to f uh, figure out what the color red is. We're using a RGB instance. So that means color red in that instance represented as a single int. It's alpha, red, green, and then blue. Alpha is 255, so it's fully opaque. I need to shift that by 24 bits. Because if you think about it, the whole thing is 32 bits because it's a single end. And then you're putting 255 uh, in one end and then shifting 24 bits. Then we're going to add red shift by 16 bits, add green shift by 8, and then add blue. There's no need to shift blue. So if we want it to be fully red, then this needs to be 255, which we need to shift by 16. Uh, and then everything else is just zero. So we don't even need to add anything. So this is a color red, this is the, the result. So array one at I, should be first of all is going to be random in the next in bound max value is is it exclusive it is so i can use color red here to produce some random value which is going to go into array one array two is going to store color red minus random value so that when we add back them add them back together we get back color red kind of works condition i less than ray length is always true uh huh it's increased here. What do you mean always true? No, nope, that doesn't compute with me. I can't see how this is always true. Well, if that errors out, it will error out at runtime. So I'm keeping that code. Uh, Unupdate. We do this. So we should just see all red if it works. Let's try that. At some point, we also need to add some time measuring code. Okay, something crashed. Exception application start. Create content. This one. What's wrong with that code? Bound must be positive. Okay. Do we also?
What is color red in that form? Is it because of T's complement, the whole thing is flipped to be negative value? Uh, okay, well, that ain't great. Just in case I'm going to... Oh, that doesn't make any sense. So that's fine. Let's try that. Random next int of this number. So we need to figure out what to do with this. Um, how about just, you know, 100,000? That'll do. So the ID actually computed that value and then it knew it was negative and it knew this was going to crash, which is why it was saying that this is always true. It could have said it's going to crash before saying it's always true. That looks good. That looks all right. I'm happy with that. That means the answer is correct. So we need to measure stuff now. We need to know how long this takes. Now we need to know how long this takes because this is the code that I'm going to refactor to GPU. Well, usually we do system nano time at the start and then at the end. Um, system nano time minus start. And that gives us number of nanoseconds that pass between the two calls. And then we can simply print that. Uh, I would like this in milliseconds. So time in milliseconds, that would be end divided by that's going to convert to microseconds and three more zeros is going to convert to milliseconds. Yeah, that looks good. And if you need seconds, obviously you just add three more zeros. I'm not going to do any kind of complex time measuring things. Just want to know reasonably quickly how long that takes. So around one millisecond, that's pretty fast. So chances are we won't be able to uh, have much of an improvement um, having this on GPU because of potential um, memory transfers. So the issue with moving this bit of code now to GPU is, okay, GPUs are fast because of the number of cores that they have, so they should be able to compute this thing faster. However, they don't share RAM uh, where this stuff is located. Currently, this is stored in CPU RAM. So what we need to do is move these arrays to GPU RAM and then move them back so that we have results. And this moving operation also takes a bit of time. So we might be losing some time there. I have an idea that we might be able to just transfer these arrays once because we're computing them on every frame and the arrays don't change in terms of the um, the, the values in the two arrays, or I suppose three arrays, those values don't change. So we might as well just send these arrays once to GPU and then be happy with it. But we'll see. Right, so first part done, second part. We're using the APAR API library. I'm going to give you the link in the description. You can download it via Maven or Gradle. And what you do is you extend kernel. And before I forget, I should add that in order to make this work, you need the GPU that, support, uh, that supports OpenCL uh, and that you have drivers also that support OpenCL. So depending on your hardware and software, this may go um, 
quite differently on your uh, run. So I'm going to just copy these arrays over here. They're going to be the same arrays uh, in terms of meaning. So array one to end result. Uh, let's just open this here so you can see. I'm going to pass these in via a constructor. How do you create a constructor? Yeah, that looks all right. So I'm going to pass these arrays in. Let's first do without uh, explicit memory. So we are going to be transferring pixel, uh, not pixels, these three arrays every frame. And we'll see how fast that is. Get global ID. So according to the API, well, I actually haven't read the entire API, but I know that this thing returns an individual index. So what I'm thinking is it returns basically an ID for a specific core on GPU. And then based on that, we can access these arrays. So I can just copy and paste this bit of code, which adds two numbers together. Well, almost if I rename this to index. So you can see that the algorithm didn't change much. And that should be everything that it needs. So I'm going to now, instead of doing that, so I'll just comment this out. I'm going to create kernel every time. Oh, that's going to be costly. And then array one, array two, uh, and then result. And then the important bit of code is to call execute, giving you the range, um, the length of arrays, which is array length. Now let's see if this runs. And we do have some kind of a test. If it's all red, then it's good. It's all red. And you can see that it takes a long time. It takes about 140 milliseconds. It even crashed at some point. Failed out of host memory. Whatever that is. Um, so you can see that it takes around 140 milliseconds versus the one millisecond that it was on CPU. Now let's see if caching this memory transfer uh, is going to simplify um, our problems. So uh, let's have GPU kernel as an object. We're going to construct just one single instance of that. I need this. Uh, somewhere here, once we've initialized the arrays. And then we're going to say set explicit mode, which basically says don't auto manage memory, I'm going to manage memory. So we're kind of delving into the almost like C++ mode. And then we're going to say, uh, we're going to put this array, we're going to put that array, and then we're going to put um, this result array. And then Actually, let's make this accessible so I can then query uh, directly from this object. And then it will compute this thing. We no longer need to pass these two arrays. In fact, we don't need to pass all three arrays at any point from CPU to GPU because we've only done it once and because the values don't change, we're happy. However, 
we need to get the result array back on each frame because otherwise we don't have the new data. Although it's the same data um, conceptually, it could be different. So we need that back. GPU kernel execute and then get it get some data back. GPU kernel get a result array. This will cause um, the transfer from GPU memory, which is store, which is going to store the data, into this array on the CPU side of things, and then using this same result array, we're going to draw that to the screen. That should hopefully make it faster than 140 milliseconds. I doubt it's going to be faster than one millisecond. Yeah. So it, it's around between one and two. But the good news is we now eliminated the memory transfer issue. Well, to some extent, there's still a lot of transferring stuff going on. But at least we eliminated um, these three transfers. And I think we have achieved what we set out to do, right? Yeah, so this is a bit of code that is equivalent to this bit of code uh, on CPU, and there you have it on GPU. Um, sadly, it's not faster in this case. The, depending on what your actual, actual problem is, it will be much faster. For example, uh, you can check out the GPU demo that um, I had with 10 million particles. It took about um, 10 milliseconds on CPU, and on GPU, 10 million took about 2 milliseconds, so it's super fast. Alternatively, if we don't do this, we could try and increase the size of the array so that to give us um, a bit more stuff to work with. And then we can say array length is this and then multiply it by I don't know, three or something. Because what I'm thinking is the more um, stuff you have in your array, the faster GPU will be because of the number of cores. So, so at this point, it's not the speed, but the number of um, cores that you can parallelize into. It's about 3.5 for uh, GPU. It's about 2.5 for the CPU. What if we make this um, slightly interesting algorithm? So at this point, I'm just experimenting. Um, something like sine. And then maybe power. Power takes a long time usually, particularly if it's not um, an integer. And then let's try and move the, this um, hoping this will compile because what's happening behind the scenes is the library that we're using actually converts this to OpenCL code as far as I'm concerned. Well, it converts it to something so it can run on GPU. Okay, we got 
what, 47-ish milliseconds. I really just should add a switch, a billion switch or something. And that's much faster. That's about seven milliseconds. Well, give or take. In any case, we now have found a problem that is faster on GPU than on CPU. It wasn't that hard. Just add a few math operations, particularly power, which is usually what makes it really slow. Anyway, in this um, video, we talked about parallel computing, particularly uh, using GPU for CPU purposes. Also, we looked at uh, some of the options that you have for Java to really just write Java code and then get it converted to GPU uh, for, say, OpenCL via the um, AP. I got to learn how to pronounce that thing. APAR API, I guess. It's a nice library. I mean, this is the stuff that we wrote in order to make it run on GPU. How awesome is that, right? Like GPU, GPU was a scary thing a long time ago, but now it's super easy and you haven't even written any C++ code in here. It's literally just pure Java. Anyway, thanks for watching. Don't forget to vote on the next video and I'll see you guys later.